uh, uh, day for our Elijah uh, series. I really enjoyed this series. Uh, I probably last studied Elijah maybe 30 years ago. Uh, it's been a while, and uh, this has been a, a, a good journey and renewal for me. Uh, what, a, what a great character, and it's the only uh, one in Scripture that says that we have a nature like him and he like us. So I identify so much with who he is and, uh, and, uh, and how we live. Let me remind you, these uh, listening guides are available. I'll have them this week, probably next week, and then when they're gone, uh, they'll be gone unless there's an outcry for uh, uh, for uh, for more, okay? All right, take your listening guide and turn to Second Kings. And I tell you, what, go to First Kings to begin. We'll get we'll, we'll get to Second Kings uh, in a few minutes. We'll get to Second Kings in a few minutes. Go to chapter. Let me see. I tell you, what, go to chapter nineteen, which is where we ended last week. And let me, because uh, we're skipping some material. Not that it's unimportant, uh, and it does relate to Elijah. I just uh, I felt like you know uh, six was uh, was uh, long enough, but I need to give you some context as we finish up Elijah uh, 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 today. Chapter nineteen uh, was the uh, the scared hero after a great victory at Carmel. He finds himself running and hiding from uh, from Jezebel in deep discouragement and depression. Dep- uh, beginning in chapter twenty. Uh, uh, there begins to be really uh, uh, conflict between Syria, Ben-Hadad, who was the king of Syria, uh, to the north and east of, uh, of Israel. And uh, in fact, there end up being three campaigns, as it were, where Ahab uh, is trying to conquer Syria, Syria is trying to conquer uh, Ahab. And uh, that's taking place in chapter 20 and chapter uh, 21. Now, when you get to uh, chapter 21, look at verse 17. <coughs> Elijah uh, appears again and, uh, and is beginning to pronounce, I'm going to read a few verses here, of what's going to happen to Ahab and Jezebel. Now, what's happened is near Ahab's palace in Samaria, there was a beautiful vineyard, a very productive vineyard, Naboth's vineyard. And uh, 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 Ahab really wanted that vineyard to build a, really a vegetable garden. And uh, uh, so he didn't know what to do, so he just had a pity party and just was brooding. Well, sweet Jezebel saw that. He said, well, you know, wh- why are you brooding? What's the deal? You're the king. He said, well, I'm going to name Boss Vineyard. Well, go get it. You're the king. Uh, okay, you wuss, I'll get it for you. So she had Naboth killed. And, uh, and Ahab, you know, gets the vineyard. But God is watching. Okay? So Elijah shows up, First uh, Kings uh, uh, chapter 21, verse 17. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down and meet Ahab, king of Israel, who is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he had gone to take possession. And you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Have you killed and also taken his possession? And you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, In the place... <laughs> In the place where dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick your own blood. And then down in verse 23, And of Jezebel, the Lord also said, The dogs shall eat Jezebel within the bounds of Israel. Well, if you go over to chapter 22, chapter 22, and really kind of the uh, third and final battle with Syria, uh, verse 35, and the battle grew hot that day, and the king was propped up in his chariot facing the Syrians until at evening he died. And the blood of the wound flowed to the bottom of the chariot. And about sunset a cry went out from the army, every man to his city and every man to his country. So the king died and was brought up to Syria, and they buried the king in Samaria, and they washed the chariot by the pool of Samaria, and the dogs lift, uh, licked up his blood. And the harlots washed themselves in it according to the word of the Lord which he had spoken. Bad end. Bad, bad end. And then in uh, uh, verse 51, Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel in Samaria in the 70th year of Jehoshaphat, who was the king of the southern, uh, southern kingdom uh, of Judah. And he reigned for only two years. Uh, <laughs> he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in the way of his mother. 
And they were the worst of the worst. So that's kind of the context of what's happening. Now, turn to 2 Kings chapter 1. 2 Kings chapter 1. After the death of Ahab, Moab rebelled against uh, Israel. Now Ahaziah, this is Ahab's son, okay, that we just read about, fell through the lattice in the upper chamber in Samaria and lay sick. He fell and he was uh, uh, hurt. Uh, so he sent messengers telling him, go inquire of Baal, the idols, Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from the sickness. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, It is because there is no God in Israel that you're going to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron. Now therefore, thus says the Lord, You shall not come down from the bed which you have gone, but you shall surely die. He only reigns two years and he's dead. So that's, that's the context. Elijah uh, showed up eh, maybe 25 years earlier unannounced in 1 Kings chapter uh, 16 and uh, opening verses 17 making that announcement of judgment uh, on, uh, on, on the king and on Israel uh, for, their, uh, for their idolatry. We have watched him from the Brook Kishon uh, and the, the lessons learned there all the way to Zarephath and the widow and her son, uh, everything that he learned in, uh, in um, uh, Mount, and Mount Carmel, uh, I think lessons that he learned in making that trek of hundreds of miles and the fatigue mentally, emotionally, and spiritually that led him to great, great discouragement and depression as a result of it. We have watched this uh, man's uh, journey for low these 20 to 25 years. Uh, in the, uh, I did something uh, that really wasn't part, but in your, uh, in this uh, listening, uh, cumulative listening guide, there is a last page that I added, which, uh, which lists all of the lessons, 20 counting uh, the two today, all of the lessons learned from the uh, uh, life and the ministry of Elijah. So uh, I hope that you'll uh, you know, grab that packet and read those lessons and uh, hopefully some of those we're applying to our own personal uh, journey as it was. But today we, uh, we say goodbye to him. And uh, uh, he has uh, uh, taught us so many valuable lessons. But I want you to read with me, uh, I want you to read, I want you to hear verse 1 uh, of 2 Kings 2 because it kind of uh, set the stage. His, his life, his work, his ministry is, is finished. I'm reminded of what Jesus said in John 17, I finished the work that you gave me to do. What a statement. I would love to think that there's enough uh, mental recognition and uh, uh, when I come to, uh, uh, to death's door to be able to look back and to say, uh, Lord, I, I, I think I finished what you called me and put me on this earth uh, to do. And uh, maybe the last dying words, uh, as were the words of Jesus, it is finished. I have done what a way to go. What a way to go. Uh, some of the most valuable lessons that I've learned in life is sitting down with people that still had cognitive uh, recognition, to sit down with them and ask them, if you had life to do all over again, what would you do different? I've heard some amazing things from some amazing uh, uh, people. And I've tried to listen and to learn from what they said uh, uh, about things that they would do different moving forward. And there's just some, uh, death can be a valuable time. Uh, death, uh, writer of Ecclesiastes says that death is one of the greatest teachers that we have. Every time we go to the funeral of a loved one or a family or a friend, uh, that can be, should be, one of the most teachable moments in our journey. Okay? Uh, especially in the midst of deep, as it were, deep, uh, deep grief. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, by a whoosh, that's really what the Hebrew whoosh, just going kind to of whoosh, I'm going to whisk him up. Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. I mean, he is, in a moment, he's going to disappear as quickly as he appeared some 20 to 25 uh, years, years uh, ago. Uh, I don't know if he doesn't age gratefully. I, I don't know, but he certainly just, he doesn't die gracefully because he doesn't die. Uh, he uh, reminds me of my uh, uh, first cousin, Enoch. Okay, now you're going to need to listen to this because this is a really good one. My first cousin Enoch, over in Genesis chapter 5, I think, verse 24, okay. All right, listen carefully. My cousin Enoch. 
Enoch was not because God took him. Enoch was not. Ah! Cousin Enoch. Okay, he was not. That's, he's an N-O-T. I'm a K-N-O-T-T. But it's, it's there. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's there. What I find, what I find interesting, and I, it, verse 1 doesn't tell us, but it appears that somehow Elijah was either spoken to by an angel, uh, by the still small voice of God that he dealt with. I'm not really sure, but evidently Elijah got some notice that he was about to die. Some notice. Uh, it's, uh, it's been amazing to me in years of ministry and, uh, and, and many times, maybe it's always, I just don't know it, uh, especially in, and uh, folks generally speaking that are elderly, that they get a sense that death is imminent. Do you ever say they just kind of get a sense, they just knew it was coming, maybe another week or month, or they just knew it was coming. And that's what's going on with, with Elijah, which raises uh, uh, this question. Uh, look at this question. What would you do if you knew today was your last day on earth? What would you do? That's basically what Elijah was confronted with. Now, I'm going to give you about 30 minutes to think of that. I'm hoping you can uh, multitask and listen to me and think of that at the same time. Because when I turn it over to the group, that's the first question you're going to respond to. So I'm giving you a little lead. So you'll be prepared to not say something stupid. Okay, get in the car and go home and say, I can't believe I said that. Okay, so just heads up. It's a warning. Okay, what would you do if you knew today was your last day on earth? Well, Elijah did two things, and I think they're very appropriate things. Number one, he reflected on the past. I think not just his past, though I think that's part of it, but he reflected on the past of the, of the nation, uh, Israel, that he had tried to serve. He reflected on the past of the, of the forefathers who had gone before him all the way back to Abraham and, and, uh, J and uh, Jacob and Joshua. So he just paused. His death was imminent. And he just reflected on where he and where the nation had been. And then the second thing that he did is that he really thought about and made preparations for the future after he was gone. If Jesus doesn't come, every one of us in this room are going to die. Okay, you can say, I don't want to face it, I don't want to deal with it. Okay, death will win. Okay, now, we are victorious over death because of our relationship with Christ, but it's coming and it's foolish not to make preparations for it, which is exactly what Elijah uh, uh, does. And he makes those preparations by returning to places. In fact, let me show you. I've got a couple of maps so you'll have an idea of uh, these defining moments. Let me show you defining moments. We're gonna sh I'm going to show you a map in a minute. Gilgal is all about starting points, all about beginnings. You'll see this in a minute as I get through each of these places. Next, Bethel. Uh, was his next stop, I'll show you the Mount Vinny, which is where over and over and again uh, uh, surrender took place in, in, a, in, a, in a person's life. Uh, third stop that we're going to make is, uh, come on, help me here. Okay, Jericho, where, there's, uh, where the first biggest, largest uh, battle took place uh, after they crossed over the River uh, Jordan, which was a place of warfare, battle, uh, difficulties, challenges, problems. And then the last was the River Jordan, which uh, was a place of separation, literally in his journey, uh, life and, uh, as it were, uh, not death since he was translated up. But uh, what I'm going to do as we go through each of these, I'm going to give you the historical significance of each of these places. What, what happened there? And then I'm going to try to make, I hope it's a short lead, to 
uh, from the historical impact to what, what does that mean to us personally? What's, what's the message, what's the, what does that place mean to you and me and our journey uh, with, uh, with the Lord? Okay, so a couple of maps to kind of give you some context of, uh, of where we are. Uh, uh, here is uh, Samaria, where uh, uh, Northern Kingdom, uh, Central Office, as it were. Tishbe, Gilead, that's where Elijah was from, okay? And he makes his way to Samaria, then to Brook Cherith all the way up to Zarephath and down to Mount Carmel and then down to Beersheba when he's in hiding all the way down to Sinai and then he makes his way back up here to anoint as we ended chapter 19 last week makes his way back up in this area to anoint uh, uh, future kings but here we are in Gilgal which is just really a few miles uh, uh, very few miles uh, west of the Jordan River and then south uh, that is, uh, is Bethel and then a little bit more eastward toward uh, the River Jordan is uh, Jericho, and then crossing River Jordan, and over in here, uh, in modern day Jordan, uh, that's where uh, uh, Elijah will be translated. All this is taking place, give you a little bit of context, uh, north and a little bit northeast of Jerusalem. These are only, uh, you know, 10, 15 miles. It's a day, I mean, easily a day's work. It's not, it's a day's walk, not far. Uh, for him to do all those. So we're going to go from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho and then cross the, uh, uh, cross the Jordan miraculously. To give you a little bit of context of what that looks like today, look at the next map. Here is the Dead Sea. Here is the Jordan River. Uh, here is the Sea of Galilee. Here is uh, Jerusalem. All of this area today, which is right in here, is Gilgal and Bethel and Jericho and Jordan. Are you with me? This is the West Bank today. You hear that on the news an awful lot. The West Bank, the west of the bank uh, of Jordan and over to the, really the split city uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem. So give you an idea of, uh, of uh, where we are, in, at least in modern day uh, uh, Israel and uh, Syria and Jordan. So I just want to give you a little bit of context of where all this was taking place. So let's look at each of these places, these defining moment uh, places, because I believe we have those same defining moment places. This first one to look at, I think probably only once, uh, though I, I, I think, I don't know if mine was unusual, but my process of beginnings and my journey to salvation was indeed, was indeed that for me. Uh, uh, it began uh, as, as a 10-year-old process uh, with a decision for Christ, and then at 14, another decision, then at 17, yet another decision, then in my early 20s, yet another decision. It just took me a while to get there, okay? I've been at, well, Jimmy, when did you get saved? Yes. <laughs> yes, okay. Was it 10? I'm not sure. Was it 13, 14? No, nah, I'm not sure. 17? Nah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but I sure head in that direction, Okay. And then nailed things down at, uh, in uh, 1973. So let's look at each of these places and stop and again see where things took place historically and then uh, uh, see how they begin to affect us uh, 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 personally uh, in our journey. Now, I'm going to uh, first talk about Gilgal, which was the place of beginnings. Why, Why is that important? Well, go back with me to uh, Joshua chapter 4. Go back to Joshua chapter 4. In Joshua chapter 4, you got to remember, uh, 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 taken into bondage, uh, it, uh, Jewish people uh, eventually delivered uh, by Moses. Uh, uh, God had promised them uh, you know, that there was a land for them west of the Jordan River, uh, 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 Israel. And uh, so they're, they're making that trek, uh, as it were, uh, all the way from Egyptian slavery all the way into the, uh, uh, into the promised land. They cross over, and this is John chapter, uh, uh, excuse me, in Joshua chapter uh, 4, uh, God had made a promise, I'm going to get you across, and you're going to conquer uh, the, the land. And as they cross, uh, Joshua, God tells Joshua to tell the people, as you cross the Jordan, which was miraculous, almost like the parting of the Red Sea, Okay, uh, the priests go first, and uh, the, uh, the 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 Jordan River parts, and uh, which is Jordan River. Typically, though, you can see usually see one side and one side is eh, thirty feet to two hundred feet. 
Okay, so uh, it's not just something you would uh, wade across, uh, as it were. And uh, uh, but God wanted this to be such a such a uh, such a beginning that He wanted it to be memorialized that they remember uh, their starting point when they crossed into the Promised Land. So as they cross, Joshua gives. Uh, the 12 tribes of Israel tells each of the leaders to make sure to pick a stone, pick a stone, okay, and place it on their shoulders. So we're not talking about a pebble or a little rock, okay, something big enough obviously to carry and to place on their shoulders. And they, uh, uh, when they get to dry land, he tells them to build a memorial, a circle of stones commemorating the beginnings of in the new land that God was giving uh, uh, to them. In, in Joshua chapter 4, uh, in verse 19, uh, the people came out uh, of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal, and he said to the people of Israel, When your children ask their fathers in time to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know Israel passed over this Jordan on dry, on dry land. Uh, for the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over, as the Lord God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up uh, uh, for us when he passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty and that it may fear the Lord your God forever. So it was simply a place of memory of their beginnings. I make the connection here that, that Gilgal for us, for me, is that place of beginnings. Uh, uh, I, and I'm going to use the term when we came into a personal relationship uh, with Christ. When we came to know him uh, personally. You see, there are, don't, don't kill over, there are four ways to go to heaven. Everybody kind of perked up. Uh, four ways to go to heaven. One, die as an infant. Die before being old enough, whatever that is, uh, probably four or five at least, uh, maybe uh, somewhere four or five up to eight or nine. A lot depends on the, uh, the, the home you grew up in and the, and the background and how familiar uh, spiritual things are. But I believe if, uh, if, we, uh, if, if someone dies before reaching that age of understanding and accountability that God is a God of grace and mercy and, uh, and he lets them into his heaven. Okay? But that's one way to get to heaven and that's to die before reaching that age of accountability. Everyone in this room has missed it. <laughs> Now, I've talked to some of your spouses, and though they say you are infantile in your thinking, okay, chronologically you're past it. Okay? Uh, there's a second way to go to heaven, and that's you have lived uh, uh, a perfect, sinless life. No takers, huh? Uh, if we have anyone in the room with a messianic complex, uh, we do have a really good counseling center. Okay. You probably need to make an appointment in the morning. Okay. Because if you think, yeah, I've lived a perfect life, okay, uh, you need help. So just kind of make your way over there. Nah, uh, none of us have done that. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So if that is the second way to get to heaven, like in the first one, we all missed it. We missed it. The third is what happened to Cousin Enoch and to uh, Elijah. Now, God can do anything God wants to do. And if God wants to translate me uh, to heaven and not let me experience death, I'm good with that. I'm good with that, okay? Uh, there's no record of that happening since uh, Elijah's experience. So it's probably not going to happen to any of us. Uh, but that's God's business, not mine. And that's uh, yet another way to get to heaven. There was only one other Gilgal. And that's in Jesus. Okay? Uh, we, went, we discussed the I am saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. But by me. 
So I don't want to ever assume, okay, even though you've got a Bible and you're in Bible study and you're uh, uh, faithful in here, uh, I want you to be able to look back. Again, for me, it was a process. That's, I don't know that that's normal. Uh, you know, it was almost a decade process from uh, an early first-time decision to one uh, some 13 years later. Uh, but I finally got it nailed down and finally got it right, okay, and, and had that assurance of that. I think if you had asked me, uh, you know, in that period of 10 to 23, Jimmy, or do you know for certain if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven? I'd say, well, I don't, I'm not sure. I think so. Maybe. I hope so. I would have answered, uh, you know, uh, been very ambiguous. But after that 23-year-old uh, experience, uh, I would have said absolutely uh, uh, yes. So uh, for each of these, I'm connecting a scripture, and this one is very familiar, 2 Corinthians uh, uh, 5:17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. The old and new has come. I do hope, and you're talking about something to be thankful for this week, uh, Go back to that defining moment in your journey. Because for some of us, it's been a while. And thank God for his inexpressible gift in Christ and uh, permitting you to come into an eternal relationship with his son and with him. So we could have a really good life here, not perfect, not pain-free, but a good life here and an eternal life uh, with him in heaven. So Elijah's first stop, I think to some degree, we don't have any record of him having gone there before, though Gilead and Tishbe, where he was from, is not all that far away. It's possible. But uh, at least for the sake of the nation and for the sake of the appreciation of the patriarchs uh, that evidently had impacted his life and, and, uh, and, and Abraham and, uh, uh, and others, he finds his way to go down. All right? Now, let me pick up in verse 2. And Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here. Elijah saying to Elijah, he'd been following for about a decade, stay here, don't, and, uh, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But he, uh, Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets were, who were in Bethel came out to Elijah and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, yes, I know it. Keep quiet, shut up, don't remind me. <laughs> kind of in the white space, okay, uh, uh, in there. So our next stop is, uh, is, uh, is Gilgal. Gilgal, uh, interestingly, means house of God. House of God. Bethel means house of God, excuse me. This is, uh, this is where uh, uh, Abraham, on two or three occasions, found himself... And when he was there, he built an altar. It's where Jacob found himself when uh, angels, he saw the angels dancing, as it were. This is where uh, 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 Jacob would return to later on and that he would have his wrestling match with God. This is where uh, uh, in a few years after that, Jacob would return and he would renew his covenant commitment to God and with God, and that's when his, God would change his name from Jacob, which means supplanter or deceiver, which is what he was, to Israel. To Israel. So every time you see Bethel in the Old Testament, there's always an altar. Always a surrender. And, uh, the, and there, were, there were really... Many different kinds. Here is one, and this goes back to, to, uh, to, to Joshua's uh, day. Uh, here, uh, built out of uh, rock, this one was a, a circular, as it were, uh, altar. Uh, sometimes they would stack them uh, vertically. Uh, again, all of this were, 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 I guess it were an object lesson. It was a visual of something going on in, uh, in, in the person's life that constituted surrender. Surrender, uh, giving up something, or getting priorities right in your 
journey. It could be family. It, it could be work. It could be material session, uh, uh, possessions. It, it could be uh, 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 surrendering to God, the loss of a spouse, loss of a kid, I mean, loss of a job. I mean, there, it's no way to tell. Uh, unlike Gilgal, uh, Gilgal, I think, is generally a one-time experience, maybe a process, but uh, which it was for me. But uh, when you come to uh, this stop in Bethel, I'm not sure they're not, well, I, I can only speak in my journey. There have been many places, defining moments in my life in, in pilgrimage for Christ that were times and places of surrender. There have been a lot of times, and, and you'll understand this, I would surrender something and I would take it back. Okay? And I would surrender it again. I mean, you get it. You, you understand what I'm talking about. I'd give it to God and I'd take, I'd take it back. And, uh, but I think this is just part of our nature being like Elijah's and part of the journey and the struggle that we all go through at times. Is because none of us ever live a perfectly lasting, surrendered life. At least I don't. Uh, here, and I think that would be true of Elijah and the other Old Testament uh, prophets as well. So, here is a, a, a verse out of uh, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where Paul says, I, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God. God has been merciful. God has been good. God has been gracious to all of us to present your bodies, your lives, everything about who you are and what you do as a living, not a dead sacrifice, but as a living sacrifice. Uh, sacrifice, uh, uh, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service or spiritual worship. It's all about surrender. And uh, most of us, because of our own uh, sense of entitlement and our own selfishness and our own fallenness, we really struggle to surrender, don't we? It's just hard to let things go and, uh, uh, and uh, not to take them back and not to feel like we know better than God. And uh, so maybe today, when you think about your journey and you think about defining moments and places, can you remember in your journey with the Lord probably a number of times where you were and what the struggle was and what you finally were willing to put on the altar and, uh, and, uh, and to sacrifice and to surrender to him? I think Elijah was uh, struggling with that uh, as well. Third, third, our next stop is Jericho, very familiar, which I wasn't sure what the word was, whether it was problems or, or battleground or, or warfare or struggles. I just know part of the journey that's real, and the sooner you accept that and embrace that as a child of God, we're not just sons and daughters of God, we are that, but we're also soldiers of Christ, which the inference is, is we're, we're in a battle. We're in a battle. <clears throat> we have an enemy. Yes, greater is he who is in us and who is in the world. Yes. The outcome of the battle is not in question. We win. We're on the winning team. But between, between now and then, we are in a fight. Not a fight for our spiritual souls, but a fight for our spiritual life mattering. Our lives mattering for God as a result of, again, having been to Gilgal, making the surrenders that we need to make a, 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 along the way. And then now we come to, uh, uh, to uh, Jericho. Uh, I would encourage you to go back to Joshua and, uh, and read what took place. All of us know that story. I think I got a picture. I'm not remember, sure which one you hear. Uh, Jericho was uh, uh, just a little bit west. And uh, really, uh, over the centuries, there have been walls that have been built around it. I'm not sure. It was probably the smaller wall that uh, Jeremiah and the people of Israel marched around, blew the trumpets and the walls fell and uh, victory took place, but not too long after that, uh, after the great spiritual battle that they had won, uh, they made their way to AI and got obliterated almost because of greed and materialism and selfishness getting away. And that battle, that, that battle's real for all of us. We win, you know, and, 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 uh, and, we, and we lose some, and hopefully uh, you know, the surrender takes place again, and then we kind of, you know, move, uh, move uh, forward. The verse that I came up uh, for this one, and there's so many, I, I love the subject of spiritual warfare, but I picked out of 1 Timothy 1.18, Paul writing to Timothy says, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. 
And I'm just asking you to realize that the spiritual battle is real and that uh, uh, and, uh, if you're not careful, you'll be AWOL, you'll be down in the battle. Just realize there's an enemy who is after you. He can't take away your salvation, but he, he can sure minimize your joy and he can sure minimize your assurance and he can sure minimize the service and the, and the surrender and the, and, the, and the blessing of living a life of fulfillment and abundance for God, living a full life. And that battle is always going on. So it's, he, he is relentless, the enemy is, and uh, he's got a greater stamina than most of us do on our own, if not all of us. So that's where that walking in the power and the energy of the Holy Spirit and letting God fight the battles with you, use you, and for you in the, in the journey is, uh, is so important, okay? And then the last stop uh, uh, is uh, the River uh, Jordan. Let me pick up in a verse... Uh, uh, pick up in verse 4 since I didn't read there. Elijah said uh, to Elisha, Please stay here, uh, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. While there, the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elijah and said to him, Do you know that the, uh, that the day the Lord will take away your master from you? And he answered, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Keep quiet. Don't add to my grief. Don't add to my grief. Don't remind me. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me uh, to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them uh, went on. Three times, I just find it interesting. I don't have a clear answer. Why does Elijah three times continue to ins uh, insist that Elisha not accompany him? Because uh, to me, it kind of stands out in the text, okay? And again, this is just conjecture on my part. And it may be some of these, or it may be a combination of these. Uh, uh, it, it could be that it was one of the ways for Elijah to test the faith and faithfulness of Elisha. Okay, I tend not to think that's a, uh, because my guess is after, 20, after at least a decade, maybe 15 years with him, he'd probably already proven that. Okay, but that, that could be part of it. Uh, it could be, number, uh, could be number two, could be this. He did not want Elisha, knowing as close as they had become uh, to one another, to be there at the moment of death uh, because of the gravity of the grief that would take place having been there when the one that he loved and respected and had coached and mentored him for all of these years and to the man that he was uh, actually died and didn't want him to experience that actual moment of, uh, of death. Uh, that could be a possibility. Uh, another possibility is, is, and we'll get this in, in, the, in the last point, of, and, and, and that has to do with everywhere, in, in many places that Elijah went, whether it was Gilgal or Bethel or Jericho, he established, as it were, a seminary of uh, schooling for prophets. And, uh, and uh, that, that uh, responsibility was going to be handed over to Elisha as he moved forward. And he knew all of these prophets uh, that were in training had really depended upon Elijah and that maybe Elisha needed to be where they were to help them in their time, to comfort them in their time of, of intense grief when Elijah had gone on. I don't want you to be with me. I want you to be with them. They need you more than I need you at this time. I mean, that's a possibility. I tend to lean in this direction. I think, I think Elijah tended to be a loner anyways. If you kind of look at the stories, he just tended to be okay, uh, uh, you know, being alone, being with himself. And he knew that death was imminent. And maybe he just wanted to be alone. And just these final hours or minutes on earth. Maybe he just wanted the, the, soli the, the solitude of the moment to think about his life and his journey and his God uh, as, he, as, uh, as he moved forward to whatever you know, was fixing to happen. I'm not really sure, but it was just intriguing to me. I said, no, 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 you stay here. You don't, go. You don't stay here. And he just absolutely refused uh, to, uh, 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 to leave him. Now, when you look at the River Jordan, and uh, you usually sing hymns. Remember the hymns, Jordan's Dormy Bank I Stand? Jordan almost always symbolizes crossing over into death, which 
technically didn't happen to Elijah, because he did die. So what's the spiritual principle? What's the truth? Maybe he's talking about death to self. I don't know that it's significantly different than our, our willingness to, uh, to go to the altar and surrender. Uh, but there's a, there's a death to self sometimes in my journey that precedes the willingness to surrender. Does that make sense? So I think there was a death uh, to a self. You see, here's a, uh, the River Jordan emptying into the, uh, uh, into the, uh, the, uh, the Dead Sea. I think this is the only picture that, that, I, uh, that I have of that. But I want you to see the scripture. I really struggled here in which scripture because there are two or three that could have pictured. I chose John 12, 24. Uh, uh, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Uh, Jesus said several occasions, if, if anyone would follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. There's that death to self. Uh, which I don't think has ever been harder. David talked about it a little bit this morning, and I'm going to, to talk about it a little bit next week. We, we live, even as believers, we live in such a world of entitlement. Such a world that dying to self and what we want or what we think we have a right to and what we think we have earned and deserved. And even when we get it, to, to know you have the, this attitude of entitlement, when you finally get it, here's what you think if you don't say it. Well, it's about time. <laughs> it's about time. So this death to self is the hardest death. It may be harder than actual death. Because there's a release that comes with the actual death. This death to self is an intense personal uh, struggle. For all of us. So, what did he do when he knew I only got so much time to live? Well, he just reflected on the past. That's a pretty good idea. That's a pretty good idea. But secondly, secondly, he prepared for the future. He prepared for the future. Everywhere he went, or almost everywhere, uh, and I put some of these verses uh, in, 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 in your notes. He started a school of the prophets. Started the school of the prophets. Whether it was Bethel, uh, whether it was uh, Gilgal, whether it was Jericho, uh, and I don't know how many other places, but he started the school of the prophets that he led, and now he was going to hand it over uh, to Elijah uh, as, uh, as well. He knew he was leaving and that Elijah would uh, replace him. I put in my notes. I don't remember if I put this in your notes. God wanted to show him you only need a successor, okay, if you've started something that needs to continue. You really only need a successor if, you're, if you've started something that really needs to continue. I don't mean that in a negative. Maybe it doesn't need to continue. It doesn't mean you're a failure. But everything has a season. And maybe with your death or passing, that season has ended, okay? Though he was leaving, God's work would go on. But he was passing the mantle. Let me pick up in verse, let me pick up in verse 9. When they had crossed, uh, oh, let me back up, uh, uh, verse 8. Then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it and stuck in the water and water. Here we go again. Another miracle was parted to the one side and to the other till the two of them could go over on dry ground. This was the final miracle, by the way, of Elijah. I've counted, I could be wrong, number 14. And you may remember, Elijah is going to ask for a double portion, double blessing. That was normally given to the firstborn. Okay, but he considered Elijah his uh, spiritual father. Okay, and he asked for a double portion. Now, I find it interesting. Uh, my research tells me that Elisha did 28 miracles. 14 times 2, 
28, interesting. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elijah, ask what I shall do for you before I'm taken from you. And Elijah said, please give me a double portion, double blessing of your spirit. That goes back to Deuteronomy 21, 17 for the, first, for the first child. And he said, you've asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I've been taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they went on and talked, behold, I, I, I just can't imagine, chariots of fire and horses of fire. Chariots, horses. Uh, the most powerful weapons of the day, uh, symbol of authority, symbol of, of power, uh, 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 separated the two of them. Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elijah saw it and cried, My father, my father. But it wasn't his father. But it was his spiritual father. The chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. As suddenly as he appeared, He's gone. Then he took hold of his clothes and tore them into pieces. Good, healthy grief. But the mantle, the cloak was being passed to his successor. How many of you remember this picture? March 26. March 26. 2000, I think I wrote it, 6. Hidden underneath that mantle and cloak is Pastor David. Many of you were here for that service that went on forever. Okay? Went on forever. But the passing, as it were, of the torch and, uh, and the mantle. And uh, I went back this week and listened to that service. Powerful, powerful, profound service. And uh, I thought about my journey, and some of you have been here for a while, but, and I thought about the men and the women who had invested in me. I've been here almost 40 years, especially that first 10 to 15 years. Uh, some men, some women, uh, gosh, I think of Doris Clawson, Betty Trainum, uh, I think of Bob and Gordon Talton, I think of Andy Yaris, I think of Bob Vickery. Uh, I, I think of uh, uh, Fred Dixon. Uh, I, uh, uh, I think of Brother Jim. Uh, I think of Pastor David. Pastor David. I look back on my journey, and I think if you'll take the time to reflect, you will as well. Along the way, there have been people who saw stuff in me that I didn't even see, who believed in me, who invested in me, who gave me opportunity. Uh, to, uh, to grow and develop and to fail and to get better at who I was and what I did. In my life, like, I think if you'll stop and think, you know, again, parents and, and teachers and coaches and bosses, I, but our lives are probably dotted, and I just want to make sure in this season we're grateful for those men and women who had a lot to do with who we are today and invested. In, and that's what had happened here in my own journey. So one of my questions for you and for me, and it's not too late, is who are you investing in? It doesn't have to be formal. Or just, but who are you taking the wisdom, the experiences of failures and successes, and who are you investing in to help them not to repeat the same mistakes you repeated, to help them to be better at who they are and what they do? The failures of your own personal journey to help them to avoid those. The failures maybe of, of, of marriage. Maybe the failures of parenting to try to help others not to repeat your mistake. I think God wants to use those in, in my journey to help others and in your journey to help others as well. So, what a way to go, right? Gone. So, two lessons. Two lessons. There he goes. When a person of God, when a man of God, when a woman of God dies, nothing of God dies. Nothing of God dies. All leadership is interim. Okay? Everyone is replaceable. No matter how good you are. Okay? But when they pass, when they die, whether it's health, whether it's death, listen, not one thing of the work of God dies. Nothing. Okay? He's bigger than any one person. 
much, much bigger. And secondly, we all leave a legacy. Make it a good one. Make it a good one. It's your choice. No one determines our legacy but us. And it's radically different than inheritance. Inheritance is what you leave behind for people. Legacy is what you leave behind in, in them. It's what they remember about who you were and your relationship and your investment in their journey, which is far more important than any inheritance that we would leave behind for anyone that we would love. So Elijah, off the scene, Elisha, uh, one of these days, uh, Lord willing, I'm going to do a series of teaching on Elisha. And because uh, he had twice the ministry that Elijah did, and Elijah had an unbelievable ministry. Unbelievable ministry.